Paul. Good afternoon, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Yes, indeed, I have heard the good professor speaking. And I must say, as I told you, I was extremely impressed um, and immediately realized that this is, this is the type of information that uh, our school should have had uh, a long time ago. Um, I met Professor Shaheen Metar. She couldn't see me, so she couldn't have met me, but we met just before we gone, got on there. Uh, last week in a presentation she did for the National Department of Education, where the Director General hosted us, uh, stakeholders in ed education, uh, in a lengthy meeting, and uh, Prof. Metar was one of the presenters, and I thought the presentation was brilliant. Um, good afternoon, everybody who is attending. Soos jylle dier die dere gekom het, het ek ook gesien dat daar een klomp Afrikaans sprekendes inkom. Baie welkom ook in die Afrikaans sprekendes. Prof. Meta is from the United Kingdom and uh, therefore the presentation today will, an Afrika will be in Afrikaans. <laughs> she was trained at the United... Uh, sorry, not in Afrikaans in English, obviously. She was trained in the United Kingdom in uh, medical microbiology, infectious disease and community health and was head of uh, microbiology at the North Middlesex Hospital and senior lecturer at the Royal Free State Hospital for Royal Free Hospital. You see, Free State, the Free State is coming through uh, for 23 years. She moved to South Africa in 2000. She served as deputy director of public health here in South Africa in the Western Cape before moving to Tiberg, Tigerberg Hospital in Stellenbosch University where she established the unit of uh, infection prevention and control in 2004. It has an exceptional training reputation across South Africa and Africa, ranging from a basic infection prevention and control course to a master's and PhD in infection prevention and control. Prof. Meta is a highly respected and a recognized world expert in infection control and when she's talking you'll understand why and has been involved in setting up IPC that's infection prevention and control programs in the UK, Europe, Far East, India, Asia and Latin America. So really a privilege to have Prof Meta with us this afternoon um, and thank you for agreeing to speak to us on a Friday afternoon, it's a difficult time in any person's day and week. But thank you very much, Prof, and over to you. Thank you very much. It's, it's really a great honor and a privilege. Um, I will try and do the best I can to simplify the information. What I, what I would like to start by doing is, if I can, possibly to share my screen. Um, and uh, there we go. Okay, so what, what I wanted to do is, first of all, to, to let you know that none of us have the answer to everything. Um, SARS-CoV-2, as you know, is the causative organism for, or virus for COVID-19. And we are learning about this new and very novel virus. It has definitely affected all our lives from the beginning to the end and will probably continue to do so for many a year to come. I think even if we get the vaccine, the new normal will be very different to what we've known before this um, close that we had earlier this year. So one of the main areas that has affected a lot of people in, in, in South Africa in particular, but globally, has been the issue about schools. So should the schools be open? Should they be closed? Has there been transmission in schools? Um, is it through the schools that we're getting transmission? Do the kids take infections home? Do the kids bring infections from home? There are a huge, huge number of questions that we all have to ask. Um, and we certainly have got to try and find the answers wherever we can. I, I must admit, I'll be the first to admit that we don't have all the answers. But we certainly have a little bit of evidence which seems to emerge constantly. And every day this evidence changes in one way or the other, depending on where it's coming from which should inform some of the issues that we want to talk about. Now, I also want to um, uh, declare 
uh, as a declaration of interest that I do serve on the Ministry Advisory Committee. And my second declaration is that I unfortunately do not speak Afrikaans. So um, as much as I would have loved to do that, I think when I have time in the future, I will certainly spend my time learning a new language. So, so, so let's get on with some of the information that we need to make a, an informed decision. This is the uh, data from hospital admissions in South Africa, looking at what happens in those under the age of 19. Um, and what we see is that of the total admissions, and this was in July, in, in, in June sometime, that the number of, P, of, of, of uh, patients with COVID-19 uh, are very, very small if you are under the age of 19. Well, I think it's actually 15, but under the age of 19. This compared with all the others, as you can see here. But much more important and very reassuring is that the mortality rate in this group is very low indeed, unless they have some very serious comorbidity. So the other point is that then why are we worried about it? And is there an issue around SARS? Um, this, so the transmission of SARS is what we want to, what infection prevention and control is about. How do we prevent transmission happening in different areas. If we look at a group of people here which are infected, let's say the three in red are the ones infected with SARS, CoV-2, um, this person could be symptomatic or asymptomatic. And usually the largest viral load that we know of at the moment is three to five days before you develop your symptoms into two or three days after you develop symptoms. So eight days into having developed symptoms, the chances are that the load that you carry of virus able to transmit is very low. However, if you get infected, there are two things that happen. And because it's the cough and it's the respiratory tract, these produce droplets which have got mucus in them and the virus is inside particles, which are then of course spread. Now the larger particles will settle on surfaces nearby because of gravity and they just fall um, on surfaces. And it is believed that now, if anybody touches these surfaces, very soon after this contamination has happened, then it will go onto your hands. And if you're not very careful, very quickly will move to your nose, mouth, and, 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 uh, and, and eyes, if you rub your eyes. The other part of it is that a certain proportion of this is known as opportunistic aerosols or the opportunistic airborne. Now, these are the finer particles that travel further because they're light and they're not drop, they don't drop by gravity and usually contain viable uh, or, or live virus in them, but not probably as much as some of the others. We don't know the answer to that yet. And if you're very close to somebody, you can inhale this and the viral particles will go past your um, upper respiratory tract, which is where the protection takes place when you, when you swallow, when you breathe in something that the body doesn't like, it usually has a cough reflex and you get rid of it. In this case, it might go past that barrier and go into your lungs and into the alveoli. So this is a really important part of what we do. Okay. The second thing which I'd like to talk about is that in the healthcare setting, and these are from the WHO, there was a brief that was done in the 9th of July, is that the, um, that the symptomatic people where they're not um, uh, uh, carrying out airborne procedures, in other words, this is for the healthcare setting, you can actually get away with just using a face mask. That means that the droplets will come towards you, but it will not protect you from aerosols, which I have just mentioned to you. But however, if you are looking at aerosols, then you really need to need a different type of a much more strong type of a, a, a respirator. What has been suggested in this briefing was that they, even though they could detect the viral particle, because this is the, the RNA of the particle or the genetic material, these studies showed that there was no viable virus in the air. In other words, if the virus is not viable or not alive, it cannot be transmitted um, to, the, to the other person, thank you, to, to the other people. So with the sample that were found, the, the amount of, of, uh, of uh, RNA, which is the genetic material, was in low numbers in large volumes of air. However, they also found that it was in a, they couldn't really identify how light these were. So just by using the detection method that is currently available, it only tells you that there is virus present. 
it doesn't tell you that this virus is alive. And I think that's quite an important point. So just because we detect the virus, it doesn't mean it can transmit. However, there are situations where this is very, very important to understand the movement of aerosols, particularly in the community. So the small droplets are, are, are expelled from the mouth uh, um, during speech and coughing. Um, and these remain viable if there is no ventilation. And this is a very important point. If there's no ventilation, they could be viable for up to three hours. The larger particles, as I just mentioned, will actually drop onto surfaces on your hands or whatever. And there is a very important relationship between the amount of virus that's produced and, of course, the transmission. But this is not entirely clear. For other diseases, we have this known knowledge. For this disease, we still don't have a clear um, knowledge about it. Now, the most common situation that we find that caused a lot of alarm are places like group gatherings, like churches and so on. And here's an example from the United States where they had two symptomatic people attending a church um, event and they later tested to be positive for COVID-19. Now, this sort of group gathering could happen in many other situations as well, not just necessarily religious gatherings. It could be happening in funerals and so on. So of the 92 people that attended that church on that day, 35 of them um, became positive with COVID-19 with symptoms and three of them died. Of those 35, a further 26 cases were found. Now these people who actually can transmit like this are known as super spreaders. So how does this happen and what is going on? So these very fine aerosols which contain particles of the virus in a poorly ventilated environment. And this from your school point of view is very, very essential. If you have a very well ventilated room, you will halve the number of droplets in 30 seconds. If it's poorly ventilated, the number of droplets will be halved in four minutes. And if there's no ventilation, it could take up to nine minutes or longer. Okay. So what's interesting about this is that airborne, sorry, excuse me, airborne transmission will increase if the movement of air is three liters per second per person. I, I don't need you to know that. I just need you to know that whether the, the air transmission, you will understand the airborne transmission occurring if there is no ventilation. And of course, if the CO2 levels which are produced by breathing are, are, are more than a thousand parts per million. That, that is the scientific explanation. But what it basically says is just verifies what I've said about this group here on the left hand side at the bottom. So what about this virus itself? What about, we? well, why are we so scared of it? It's a very efficient virus. It transfers very efficiently, but it in itself, it's a very, very fragile virus. It's got an envelope, which, which gets destroyed very easily by pure detergent, just by washing hands, just by wiping down. It's very, very sensitive indeed. It's very susceptible to heat, to drying, to detergent, disinfectants, and, and UV light, like sunlight. It, it can survive on clothes up to 24 hours in laboratory conditions. That has been not reproduced in many other studies yet. Um, but the maximum after that 24 hour period that has been able to survive has been two hours in some studies that have been done um, from China. But this route of transmission is not a very known route of transmission. So what seems to happen is that your contact with an environment that is like surfaces that have been, which have got a high load of virus um, and quickly transferred to the face is much more likely to pass on the virus than if you are from clothes. But I'll show you some more evidence in a minute. The disinfectants that are being widely purported to be used, uh, these are always not a good idea because they're inactivated by dirt and by debris. So in, if you want to apply disinfectant, you have to clean the surfaces thoroughly before doing so. And this is why when the system about cleaning and disinfection comes up, one has to make this point. There's also no evidence of transmission from surfaces like grass or pavements or roads. And therefore it is quite ironical to see people going around spraying the streets with, with, with a lot of um, chemicals, which are in fact unnecessary. Um, fumigating outside in marketplaces, this is not recommended. And I'll show you some data about the evidence of, of, of disinfectants on humans. This is a rather nice paper produced by Chin, uh, which was published in The Lancet, which is a very reputable journal, as you probably know. Um, and this may be answering some of your questions. Okay. So, for example, the question is, where does this thing survive? So, as teachers and, and, and schoolgoers, um, you might want to think about, does it survive on paper? 
And one question I've been asked is the teacher say, can we be marking papers? And the answer is, yes, you can, because within 30 minutes, there's nothing left. Tissue paper, well, I hope nobody writes on tissue paper, but if it is there, again, nothing happening. Um, what you do find, of course, is that it seems to survive much better on glass, uh, stainless steel, and plastic. In other words, on smooth surfaces. And this is very interesting. If you look at it, the survival on cloth, it's really not very much, as I, as I said. So, um, on it, but if you're wearing a, a mask, and in this case, it was a surgical mask, um, or it could even be a, a, an ordinary cloth mask, inside the mask and outside the mask, where all the breath, all the, the sight is coming from where you can get the, 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 um, viral, the virus particles being produced, inside and outside, are the ones that get contaminated frequently, obviously, when you're speaking or talking, and they will remain contaminated for a much longer period of time. So I think this is an important piece of information we need to remember. The second thing is that environmental cleaning uh, is a standard precaution in infection control for healthcare facilities. But this is a multimodal approach. So when we talked about schools opening or healthcare facilities or any other organization opening, we must make sure that we understand that this is structured so that everybody understands what is going on, staff is trained, the policies are in place, and there's infrastructure and there's supplies, and then you get monitoring and feedback from this. This cannot happen unless we do that, sorry, unless we do that. And also that the elements that we need, no matter what is going on, no matter how relevant it is within the system, you must make sure that these elements are as, as heads of schools or, or heads of departments, you need to make sure this has happened. And it's a very, very important part of what's happening. So clearly, the products that are used for cleaning and disinfection, and this is to alleviate any myth, uh, myths that have been in the past. Basically, in order to apply a disinfectant, you need to clean first, and that is a mechanical action. It's always the first step in cleaning, and generally, 99% of the time, you only need to clean. You don't need to apply disinfectant. Disinfectant applying is really quite um, sometimes dangerous, and I will, I will talk to you about that. Now, disinfectants are chemicals. They're toxic substances, they're chemicals, which are they inactivate or kill pathogens. And of course, they will not act in the face of organic matter or soil. Uh, these have to be removed first. And of course, they are of different levels, which is low level up to medium or high level, which are used in healthcare facilities. Uh, and this is the hierarchy of resistance or internal intrinsic resistance, uh, which I'd like to take you through. So the most resistant bugs, bacteria, viruses, whatever you want to say, to, to kill are spores. Uh, Clostridium difficile is one, the one that causes tetanus, um, which is Clostridium tetanus, and, and perfringens, which causes diarrhea and so on. Those are the most resistant because these are like nuts, like hard shells on the outside, and the disinfectant cannot penetrate. The next one is Mycobacterium tuberculosis. This is very um, difficult to treat or to, to kill when using a disinfectant because it has a thick waxy coat outside it, so that it's protected. The smaller viruses now are coming down. Um, Non-envelope viruses like polio and so on are becoming more easy to kill. Fungi are still in the middle level, as you can see. Um, vegetative bacteria, which are normally gram-negative pseudomonas. E. coli is a common one that you might have all heard of. But look down here. The most susceptible of all these is SARS-CoV-2, HIV, and um, and influenza and so on. And the reason I put this to you is because the fear that we have that this is a terrible, terrible bug is actually not true. It is a highly sensitive and a very fragile organism. And that is why we must remember that. So good cleaning will always take precedence over any disinfection. Looking at non-healthcare settings, uh, where, where which is these to start off with are much less contaminated than the healthcare environment because it doesn't have a cluster of people who are producing the virus constantly who are sick and so on. So here, looking at this, um, there is a, you can reduce these potentially from schools and gyms and so on. There are two areas that we need to pay attention to in this uh, situation. One are the high touch surfaces, which are identified as priority disinfection. And you can understand if children are running in and out, the door handles, the window handles, uh, touching the kitchen in the food preparation areas over countertops, bathroom surfaces, toilets, 
you know, and then those people sharing computers and using computers. So it is quite clear that wherever the hands go, they will be considered high touch surfaces. Okay. Then the other point is very important is that they, whatever disinfectant you use, they have to be very carefully selected because many of them are toxic and they're corrosive and they mustn't have high side effects. So if you are concerned about the cleaning of an environment, let's say, for example, in the school, um, the ideal situation would be to clean in the morning and clean after everybody's gone. Uh, and you can wipe over with the disinfectant, which I'm going to mention in a minute. However, if you can only do one cleaning, so we can then discuss which cleaning would be better. And to your mind, when do you think would be the better time to clean? Um, and given the fact that there is no further virus being put into place, I would strongly recommend that you can clean in the morning, but you can clean and disinfect but when the school closes in the afternoon. But if you're running two sessions of school, then you need to think about what happens in between. So once the surfaces are clean, the recommendation by the WHO is either chlorine, thousand parts per million, no more, no less, must be that, uh, or 70% alcohol. But let me just remind you that in these settings, it is ventilation, which is the key. We know that the, the virus is produced from the mouth um, on breathing, talking, and so on. And this is where it goes. And so if you increase the ventilation, you will reduce the number of, of organisms in the environment. And again, of course, you want to clean, of course, we will. What is of interest to, um, which is this paper, that this um, uh, recommendation from the WHO, is that in space, uh, fogging spraying is not recommended, okay? And of course, this in itself, showing that spraying uh, will cause irritation to the eye, and I'll show you some data on that in a minute. Uh, spraying and fogging of certain chemicals, like chlorine-based chemicals, is not recommended because it has major effects on workers, which means on humans. And I think it's very important to remember that just because we feel that somebody's doing something because it's all foggy and it's very much like, like mirrors um, and magic, uh, that we are doing something. It doesn't necessarily mean that at all. And we need to be careful about that. This is a rather good table, which I always refer to by the Pan American um, Health Organization that was published recently. And what it did was to look at the health risk from skin contamination and inhalation and so on of disinfecting agents that were used for fogging or for, for fumigation. And they looked from ozone, hydrogen peroxide, uh, hydro, um, sodium hypochlorite, which is chlorine, hydrochloric acid and other compounds, UV and, and isopropyl alcohol. I don't want to put, uh, I don't want to give you all the details, but what need to note and that eyes, nose and uh, skin, throat, all of these are irritated by chemicals, as we well know. So uh, uh, there is a saying that if you walk into a room and, you're, and you feel irritated, either in your eyes, nose, and things, you know that there's a chemical problem in that room. Okay? And it's very important that we understand this very clearly. So this, of course, is a major issue with us and our children, because if children have got asthma or eczema, any spraying of chemicals on them and around them is always going to cause a problem. And this includes uh, many of the children that have got, who come from high uh, income countries and from, and from very clean social backgrounds have got a much higher incidence of asthma and, and eczema compared to children coming from, from, from lower um, income systems because the immunity is much lower in that regard. There is a set of guidelines called um, uh, the COVID-19 disease um, uh, infection control guidelines. And basically, I just wanted to point out again and again that it's a fragile virus. It's very easily destroyed. You can increase the cleaning, and this is mainly for healthcare, for healthcare facilities, a wipe over with chlorine, no spraying of the environment, no spraying outdoors, and no spraying of humans, please. Um, and and I, I, I think it's important that we just look back to see where the spraying story started. And it started when people were trying to kill mosquitoes in Africa mainly, but other parts of the world, in Latin America and, and, in, and in the Far East, because of yellow fever, dengue, and they had Zika virus in, 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 the, in, in Latin America and malaria. Now, what, this was, what was happening was that there would be people walking around, as you can see this man here, who would spray a thin oil over any sort of fluid, uh, surface water, to kill the larvae, and then again, they would spray the bushes and so on to kill the, 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 um, the, the adult mosquitoes. Now, this is very environmentally damaging, and of course, it has been asked by the WHO, asked if we could stop doing this. 
because it was, and it has been banned in many countries because of the effect it has on humans and in the environment, because DDT does in fact deteriorate in the environment and killed a lot of flora and fauna. So, it, so this is where it started. For some reason, this then became transferred onto humans, um, thinking that if we can kill mosquitoes, we can kill humans. I'm really not sure how that happened, but it is not something that one should be doing. Um, the impact of the disinfectants is that for eyes, I've already mentioned eyes, uh, skin, and the respiratory tract. In children, you've got contact dermatitis and exacerbation of asthma, which might be of relevance to you and your group. Chemical exposure to the, res to the residue. So after you've done the fogging, if the kids come or adults come and they come and they sit on the bench uh, at the, uh, and put their arms on the table, then they will actually have residual chemicals all over their, their, their forearm, um, and this is a problem. But highly important is the fact that there is no evidence that by doing this, you reduce transmission, because that is not the way it's transmitted. And the point, if you take no other point away, I want you to take away the point that this virus is transmitted by the respiratory tract, okay? And that is where we need to concentrate on reducing the, the transmission from. So by, 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 by uh, environmental fogging or spraying is gonna make a little bit of difference, no difference at all. The other problem is that these um, uh, disinfectants will accumulate in the waterways and they have a huge detrimental effect on plants and birds and animals as we all know. But also importantly, it increases resistance to antibiotics. And because the mechanism of resistance for the disinfectant, which is a chemical, is very similar on the bacterium or the virus as it does for, uh, for antibiotics. And by doing this, there's an increase in resistance and, 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 and this is really causing a problem globally. So this is some work that we did while I was working in, in, in Sierra Leone, where we looked at the spraying of humans and uh, there were 500 healthcare workers, um, 550 people who were affected with Ebola and uh, 500 people who were not affected with Ebola. And basically we went to see where they were sprayed and most of them were sprayed in the red zone. And even though I was working in the red zone for three or four months, I must say I, I never allowed them to spray me. And I still seem to be here to tell the story. Um, the um, people with Ebola mainly got sprayed either in the back of an ambulance or when they were leaving the um, Ebola treatment unit. And you can see uh, practically all of them were sprayed there. Uh, the adverse events that were noted after single spraying, the, if they had eye infections or eye problems before, uh, and if they went from single to multiple, it doubled. So like their eye problems previously was seven, um, then 34% of them developed it when they had multiple exposure, 59%, coughing went from 39 to 60%, doubling all the way down, with breathing difficulties, chest tightness, uh, burning throat and skin conditions. So if you can imagine somebody walking in and out of a tunnel that has got chlorine in it two, three times a day when they're coming and going to school or when they're coming and going to pick up a taxi, you can imagine the impact that this is going to have. And we found was also more importantly that even though they wore protective equipment for the eye and the skin, like they were wearing skin cover, they were gloves, they were wearing eye masks and so on, they still managed to get infection. They still managed to get the side effects. And when we compared the healthcare workers with the Ebola survivors, the eye problems in the Ebola survivors was more, but the chest problems in the healthcare workers was far higher than that. And there's major damage, despite the population wearing uh, personal protective equipment. And the reason for that is this, that whether you wear something on your face or not, if you have got, if you can, for some reason, inhale chlorine, it goes into your lungs and it converts to hydrochloric acid, which the chemistry teachers amongst you will know what I'm talking about. Um, and both hydrochlorous and hydrochloric acid are extremely poisonous. These will then change the acid levels of your blood and destroy the, the lining of your, of your lungs. And then the chlorine exposure will drop your blood pressure. So what happened in, in, in Sierra Leone was that when this would happen, people thought that, uh, that the person was dying of Ebola, particularly if they had sprayed them, put them in the back of a van, which was then sprayed inside, totally sealed off, sent for three hours from Bo to Kenema uh, to be tested or whatever um, with 35 degrees outside and maybe 60 degrees inside. So when they arrived there and they were found to be dead, people thought or people recorded them as dying of Ebola. And I, I beg to differ. Um, 
this was uh, just recently um, uh, during the COVID outbreak, looking at what was going on. And there were two things which are quite clear on this. In, in uh, 2018 and 19, the use of disinfectants was much less. And obviously, as you'd imagine, the disinfectant use had gone up. But what was also interesting was that the number of aid, uh, the uh, uh, healthcare uh, cleaners who reported the uh, exposure also rose in parallel with the disinfectants. So this in its, uh, the, and these were the, the sort of reported to the occupational health people, which just goes to show that there is a bit, a bit of an issue here. So um, not so long ago, we saw this document came out in April, where it said that South Africa, the, we've got automized airborne disinfectant, which uses ERSA. Uh, so this has got turbines, it does this, it does that, you know, a whistling, dancing sort of situation. This mist settles on surfaces, cleaning it of bacteria and viruses. So we now know that we cannot clean unless you do mechanical uh, rubbing. Uh, so therefore, that was a bit of a mist. Uh, and also creating a dry mist, which was then all over the place. And so it can't be wet and the floors are fantastic and everything is amazing. And there's this disinfectant that's used, which requires dilution with water at this ratio, and therefore it's highly efficient. Okay. So we rang him up and we said, can we please tell us what, what the chemical is that you're using? Mm. And today, we have not heard anything back from them. We don't know what this chemical is, and therefore, it will be very dangerous to allow people to be exposed to this sort of thing. And the similar sort of thing happened. Um, uh, this is why the uh, advisory came out on, on, on tunnels, and a lot of documents were written, and a lot of papers written by all of us, and places like the Daily Maverick saying this is not a good idea. Uh, the WHO theory recommended that spraying of individuals with disinfectant is not recommended under any circumstances, end of. So I think this is quite important, and I think we need to understand this because of the various issues that, that, uh, that arose. This is the um, advisory that came out of the Ministry Advisory Committee, and it says that there's no evidence that spraying of humans can prevent transmission, however, quite the obverse, where it causes damages to skin and eye and so on. Now, uh, uh, this um, is the Hazardous Substance Act of South Africa, and now, of course, chemical, uh, industrial chemicals very much sit in this group, so we have to be careful about that, plus the fact that uh, the Occupational Health and Safety um, Act will support um, your teachers to make sure that this sort of exposure doesn't happen. Okay. So, I think what, I was, what I'm trying to do is to explain to you why it's unnecessary to spend vast amount of money in, in, in getting rid of something that we can't see, or indeed is not a risk to us at all, apart from a fear of our own. So, there are no touch technologies which have been widely um, sort of uh, purported as being useful. We do not use them. They are really a vaporized hydrogen peroxide is only used in very serious outbreaks in intensive care units if they have very, very nasty bugs. If you remember that list I showed you, these sit on the top of that. So they're looking at much, much more resistant bacteria, not for routine use and certainly not generally used for COVID. So first of all, the room is thermally cleaned, absolutely, as one has to do if you're going to use this. It has to be unoccupied for the safety of staff and patients. And of course, then if you want, you can spray it with 3% to 5% hydrogen peroxide and let it uh, rest for a couple of hours. And then you can go back in again because that then converts to water and air. The other one is the UV technology, which is widely distributed around and uh, again uh, touted as something that's going to have to, uh, is very good for you. I'm not going to go into the details of it, but suffice it to say, again, only used in healthcare settings, except very rarely in other situations. You have to clean the room. The room has to be unoccupied because of the danger of exposure to UV. And it is only effective if you have line of sight exposure. So here's the bug and here's the light and this is the way it has to work and it has to act. Um, and it has to do it at a particular rate where the, uh, where the organism is then destroyed by the UV light. So I think it's really important that in a school you can't keep on emptying and the classroom and doing things to it and then bringing it back again because it's just not going to work. Um, these are just uh, something to show that, yes, we do use UVGI, we use it in closed chambers, we use it for air sterilization in closed environments and for water sterilization, but it can cause eye irritation and cancer in some times. Okay, so now that we moved away from that, I hope I have actually put it very clearly to you that there is no need to use a lot of chemical in the environment for several reasons, not the least of which it is toxic to humans. 
So if we are going to now, and we know that the way we are transmitting this virus is through the respiratory tract, through aerosols and, and, and droplets and so on. So how do we then clear our aerosols from confined spaces such as a pharmacy, a church, a tea room, a school, whatever else you want to do, from public buildings, for example? And the answer, I think you know yourself, and I can hear a chorus out in the audience now saying, ventilation. Well, that's absolutely right. You open the windows, you increase the airflow. The less the airflow is the more spread of the virus. And again, I would just remind you that, that ventilated rooms uh, will halve the number of droplets in 30 seconds. Non-ventilated will take nine to 10 minutes. Okay. So I think it's very important that we understand this. And we have found that tea rooms have been a special area in healthcare facilities that have allowed for transmission because you are protecting yourself all day long and then you throw off your clothes, you come in, you drop your PP, you wash your hands, you flop down, and then you start talking to your friend and showing them pictures from last night and whatever else, and they're far too close. And there's a lot of transmission with no ventilation at all. So the next question that comes up is how long should a building remain closed? If a person is discovered um, to be and has found to have uh, positive for COVID-19, um, they seem to be a huge move to intensely clean and disinfect and leave the place closed for four days, whereas we uh, frequently see. And I'm not really sure where that came from, but let's look at some of the evidence around this. And again, I remind you, the root is by the respiratory tract. It's a fragile virus which dies very quickly. And if you are in contact with a person, this contact is defined as within a meter for 15 minutes with no eye uh, or, or with no face protection. Okay, so if you're not in, if you're walking past somebody on the street, if you're walking your dog and somebody's running by you, that is not a contact. Um, once the contacts have identified, then a risk investigation, a risk assessment, and investigation should be done properly. And if it is only one group of people working in one area, then it's very easy to cordon off that area, clean it, and open again. And there's no need to close down the whole school or the whole hospital or whatever else that people are doing. And this is actually because it is low, there's low risk of recommendation if every day there is cleaning and disinfection, if there's universal masking, and if there's hand hygiene and social distancing in place, there is no reason for this virus to get to you. And certainly not in the way that most people believe it will be. So one, once this has been confirmed, and everybody's feeling quite, supposing they're feeling nervous, then you wipe down the surfaces there um, and the workplace can be opened and go back to normal. And, and you can, as long as these are being followed them quite meticulously. We don't need to close for long periods, maybe a couple of hours because you want to clean the place and, and that's about the end of it or disinfect it, that's fine, nothing more. When we open public institutions, um, the first thing about schools, which I found quite amusing, was that there was a huge amount of fogging and cleaning going on in schools, but they, they, they'd been closed in March. And um, there was no, nobody going to school with SARS-CoV-2 at the time. So it is rather interesting to see how much money and effort was spent on cleaning a clean school. Um, if there were contamination, something had happened, the virus would have died because it's very fragile. Then looking at transportation of taxis and so on, Again, a lot of fogging going on, okay. Um, uh, what they really need, again, is water detergent. Wipe over the surfaces, dry it up. Um, and if you're very, very bothered, then you wipe over with, the, uh, with a cloth which has got some disinfectant in it, like chlorine or alcohol. We're looking at there is re there's residue or chemical residues on non-porous surfaces, as I showed you earlier on, on the desks and chairs. These have to be wiped down and removed. If you're really concerned, then you can actually increase the frequency of cleaning. And as we were talking just now, that if you're moving to a double shift school, in other words, morning to afternoon and afternoon to, to late afternoon, then you can actually do your frequency of cleaning can be adapted to that sort of um, move of, of, of what you expect to do. There should be a good checklist of cleaning, as I mentioned, water supply, we're looking at toilet sanitation, and we need to have good training for, for the teams that are going to be working. Okay, so now we come to a slightly towards the end of what I want to talk about. So the questions about reopening of schools is, are children infectious to other children and staff? Um, in other words, is my child at risk or am I at risk as a teacher? Uh, when should the schools reopen? Well, I think that's become a moot point now because we know when they're opening. Which grade should allow to start? 
Um, and what transmission-based precautions should be put into place? And this is the bit I'd like to address uh, more than any of these above here. Oh, no, I would like to address the first one as well. So masks, increased hand hygiene, social distancing, smaller classes, what are we looking at? So just to remind ourselves that the, that the how contagious is a child, okay? The children, this is a paper that was published quite a while, with July 30th, actually not so long ago, where they showed that children under the age of five had lower levels of virus, live virus particle, compared to children between 10 and seven, five and 17. So this is the group here we're talking about, compared to this plot here, which is much higher. And what's of great interest is that the five to 17 year olds are very similar to adults. In other words, they have more virus and they can transmit more virus. But we've now found new data a couple of days ago, which changed a little bit of that. So therefore children under, uh, uh, younger than five have high amount of viral load in their nasal pharynx compared to the older children. And this has just been found that you know, even though that the viral load was low, now this is a problem that do we think these are viable? Um, then a study which was done just, just, just literally last week showed that in, uh, they reported that there's a correlation between high levels of RNA as detected by the PCR and the able, and it basically means is that the children, even though they're asymptomatic, where before that we thought that they didn't have a lot of virus on board, we know now that they do have virus on board and that they can transmit mainly to other children, but also possibly to adults, because they might be either symptomatic or asymptomatic, okay? And I think this is quite an important point because the question then arises, should children be wearing masks when they're at school? And the answer of course is yes, they should, okay? I'm not gonna go through this one, um, so, so when should schools reopen? So this is evidence that I've gathered from several different um, uh, papers and publications. So there's some evidence that school closures in, in, in some countries led to a decline in community cases. When they opened the schools, if they had low community transmission, there was no effect. It made no difference whether the schools were open or not. Where there was high community transmission, as soon as the schools opened, there was an increase in transmission between students, but not to staff. That was interesting. However, when you move to a country like Israel, there was a big surge after the schools opened, um, and they had to reach and, and they had to close down, as did indeed Korea. So, in those situations, the school was they thought involved with the trans increasing the number of cases in the community. So what are we looking at on the transmission control? Away, the use of face masks, obviously age dependent, I'll go into that, reduce the size of class, um, look at the physical barriers which some countries have put into place, the temperature checks at school entry level, well I don't know how efficient they are, how good they are, but there you go, that is something that has been done. Routine screening for antibody tests, absolutely not in South Africa. Contact tracing of a child or a staff member is found to be positive, yes we would do that. And very, very importantly is the infrastructure for us. Um, and that is to reopen a school safely, we must make sure that there's good uh, ventilation and air filtration, that the surfaces are cleaned frequently, that there are facility for regular hand washing. And I just want to show you this, which is a lovely uh, picture I found looking at a tank of water and they put in six, uh, five or six hand wash basins at the bottom here, which are actually um, quite happily uh, used by everybody. So there's lots of water, there's lots of soap. And I think one of the questions somebody said to me, doesn't this cause a problem because of the, of the zinc or the stainless steel? And the answer is no, because you're using a detergent. And if you wash your hands for 20 seconds, you should get rid of the virus. And then of course you need to provide space for physical distancing. So what are the sort of precautions or the things that are going on at the moment. We're saying that under the age of two, the children do not need to be masked, okay. Between two and seven, it's not necessary, but it'll depend upon social distancing and exposure. Between seven to 12, we think that you can assess the risk. However, it is not dissimilar to the adult. So from let's say seven to 10 year olds and forward, they would be producing as much virus as the adult and their contact systems are, are also in that situation. Um, and this is the paper I referred to from August, which said that the pay, uh, children may be asymptomatic and can transmit mainly to their own peers, but possibly to adults. 
Um, and the German said that not to the adults because they had actually, the, the teachers uh, were at a distance, but of course, some of them also doing distance learning. So this is just to remind ourselves of where we are going to do what we want to do. First of all, between the infected community and ourselves, we're looking at face covers, which are cloth covers. Um, and then from there, we are going on to look at the big droplet issues or the small droplet issues where we need environmental cleaning and definitely hand washing and sanitizing. If we're breathing it in, we're looking at social distance and masks. And overall, if we want to get rid of all this all together, we're looking at good, strong ventilation systems in place. So the best practices in schools, and I'm coming to the end uh, of, of my talk, uh, the social distancing in the class and playground, um, children should wear cloth masks, a teacher should wear a cloth mask, but the very, very vital part of this is that you must take frequent mask breaks. And it is recommended from the Netherlands and from Italy and Spain that you let the children go out every two hours. And they will go out, they will take off their mask and they need to breathe air. I really am not really bothered about children distancing themselves in playgrounds and so on, because there's a lot of ventilation around. But the problem with keeping a mask on for long periods of time in a closed environment is the accumulation of carbon dioxide. Um, and sometimes children react badly to that. Okay, so that's really important to put in your protocols. The surfaces can be cleaned frequently. You can have a class monitor who helps to do that. You can have the teacher who helps to do that. Um, and obviously you want to use, wash your hands as often as possible or use a sanitizer. We've talked about the, the water and sanitation supplies. And basically you, you stay home if you're not feeling well. Um, it's no point in putting out disinfection tunnels and I'm afraid I apologize. I don't apologize, but I feel sorry for those of you that did spend vast quantities of money on that. Uh, you would have rather been better investing your money in hand hygiene or hand washing or increasing ventilation. Open the windows and you need to clean the surfaces quite regularly. Okay, and this is my summary. I would strongly recommend this document, which is the key messages and action, which I'm sure many of you have seen already. I only came across it a couple of days ago. Um, if we say, it's a, uh, we need to just remember, it's a fragile envelope virus that is transmitted by the respiratory tract. It does not need extensive disinfection after thorough cleaning. Uh, you can maintain safety of staff with social distancing, good hand hygiene, uh, proper PPE, which is in this case cloth mask and frequent education of the community. We reduce the droplets by social distancing, protecting the environment by cleaning. Uh, and making sure that one is wearing uh, face covers, wash your hands, keep the environment clean and dry. And of course, if you want to, or you definitely need to do, is to look at aerosol transmission by increasing the ventilation. Um, I'm not going to show you this video. I will stop here. I will stop sharing. Um, and I am quite happy to answer any questions should you have any. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor. That was great. Uh, again, uh, very privileged to have been able to listen to it, and I'm sure that many of our attendees gained quite a lot of knowledge and information from the presentation. There are certain questions. Paul was in the background moderating, and uh, I'm going to hand over to uh, Paul to... Uh, tell you what those questions are, and then they, they've been interesting. I've seen them. So please, over to you, Paul. Yeah. Prof, thanks very much. I'm just going to verbalize them, being, at a, being a Friday afternoon. Um, well, first question was, good afternoon. I had a rather strange query regarding shoes and COVID-19. Our learners are allowed to go barefoot when wearing summer uniform. As we and COVID are moving towards spring, I would like to know whether it is essential that children wear school shoes or not. Can I leave you with an image? <laughs> yeah. That is protection for COVID-19. Your hands, your eyes, your nose, your mouth. Anything below that, you're on your own. There's no need. That's too far from the face. Then don't worry about the feet at all. Don't worry about shoes at all. And as I mentioned to you, there's no need to worry about the non-porous surfaces outside the lane and straight. And I think kids are having enough of a hard time without them not being forced to wear shoes or overshoes or whatever. So, no, the feet are not necessarily uh, any part of this transmission. While you were busy with that, I, I remember the, uh, the question. Um, uh, you refer to covering of the eyes. Is this good enough? Yeah, it's good enough. Yeah. Very good. Thanks. Thanks. 
As long as you don't poke yourself in the eye when you're trying to clean your glasses. You know? uh, you'll have to excuse my pronunciation of the medical term here. Yeah? The question is, Prof, what is your view on using Redesivir as a possible vaccine for COVID-19? R-E-N-D-I-S-I-V-I-R. I'm, I'm not going. To, I, I I'm not going to comment on vaccines or or management or clinical management uh, for two reasons. First of all, I don't feel qualified to do so to this audience, and number two, there is such a lot of movement out there, and um, every day there's. I mean, they're like you know hundreds of people producing vaccines and remedivir and all this sort of stuff is going on. So I'm not going to say anything about that, but. I would strongly recommend that if you need more information about that, you should talk to the ID boys or talk to the or to the GPs. At the moment, I don't think that's the route we're going, but I, I'm I'm not going to comment on it. Okay, well, I'm going to say something, and I know I'm going to, you know, challenge next week. So um, no, okay. I'll cut that out the recording, Prof. Um, okay. <laughs> what, what about what about sand pits in preschools? It's fine. No Absolutely problem. Absolutely fine. Okay. No. Um, how are you going to get the kids to socially distance at that? What age are they? Four or five, no? That's a, that's how are you going to get them to socially distance? No, I think that's going to be the no, big so then what, are, they, are they going to wear are they going to wear face covers and then play in the sand pit? And then then throw sand at each other and get a mouthful of sand? Or I mean hmm. how's it going to work for them? Hmm. There's nothing wrong with the pit. The pit's fine. You don't need to worry about the pit. It's the kids playing in the pit that we need to think about how we're going to deal with that. Okay. It, it's um, so if they've got a face cover and they've got sand, then they might get sand behind the, 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 the mask. Mm. Um, if they're playing by themselves in the sand, but it's perfectly safe. If they are playing, um, we, we, we've started saying to the healthcare workers that if you're sitting in a room and you stretch your arm out and you can touch your, your neighbor, you're too close. Okay, but you can't say that to a child. So from an infection point of view, there's nothing wrong with the pit. From protecting the child, I, I, I'm not entirely sure there is a way we can do that because of that age. Um, they will hug and kiss each other. They will, you know, poke each other's nose and their own nose. And, you know, there's a lot of fiddly bits. I mean, the hygiene is awful at that age. So what are you going to do to protect the child? And it's difficult to tell a child that you're playing with by yourself in the sand pit, you know, alone. The whole point of getting into a sand pit is that there are the kids with you. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know the answer to that, but I do know that from an infection control point of view, there is no danger of the sand pit per se. Two I questions. That answers the question. No. There are two questions with regards to the use of air conditioning to create good ventilation. Okay. So this is, a, this is a lovely question, because people believe that air conditioning is equal to ventilation. It's not. It's equal to cooling of air. That's what air conditioning do, does. It actually brings in air from outside, and it cools it, so you feel a lot better for it. Um, and then it sometimes recycles it, depending on the type of air conditioner, or other times it goes out. Okay. So it is really for personal comfort that one uses an air conditioner. And there really isn't any major risk if it is no recycling of air. There's another part of the ventilation story is that we don't want to recycle the air. We don't think the virus will survive in it, but we also don't want to take a chance. So the better thing to do is to actually have air conditioning and a window open if you can. I'm, I, not in the summer, I would imagine, but if we could possibly have air conditioning with outside air only and the release of air from that room, that would be the best way to do it. But honestly, the best way to do it, to do ventilation is to open a window. Um, yeah. But I can understand if you want to use air conditioning. Do you, do you have air conditioners in your school? Are you using air conditioners in your schools? Yeah, some of them do. I think some of them do run air conditioners, so they, they would have that. Okay. So in the administrative block, it doesn't matter because they know, you know, you're just on your own with but if you're in a, in a classroom and you've got air conditioning, then I think you need to think that through. Okay. Somebody needs to come and just check to see if there is enough carbon dioxide removed or not. There were two questions about face shields. Um, one was just what about face shields? And the other one is how effective are face shields for learners who are deaf, etc., who cannot wear cloth masks? 
It's a really good question. And we've battled and we've talked about this over and over and over again. So the first thing about face shield is that it is not as protective as a face mask. No? Obviously, because it sits like this, a bit like my hand. Really. It sits like this and, the, and, and there's a space around it. So for children who have got disabilities and autistic children, um, it's really difficult for them to cope with the face mask. So they can have a, a, a face shield, okay? And as you quite rightly say, for deaf children, what do we do? So um, the Thai and the Indians have got a face uh, mask, which has got a, a transparency type window in the middle here. So the children can actually see. I did get one of those masks to test. It, it's really not very good quality because you breathe and then it gets clogged up. But if you could get something like that, I think that is, that is quite useful. But the face shield is perfectly fine from that point of view. Um, it is a big challenge and we are going to be looking at it next week sometime again um, with the WHO just to see what we can do about it. Okay. As soon um, as I get to know, I'll send it on to Paul and he can let you know. This one you might also decide not to comment on. Um, got any information with the advantages of gurgling with diluted peroxide? Um, no, I don't have any information on that at all. There's no evidence at all. But they do, um, I mean, just by the act of gargling, whether it's salt water or something else, it just cleanses that part of the throat. Mm. You know. Okay. Um, and, and, and that, I mean, people use salt, don't they? Salt garden is supposed to be excellent for you. Um, I, I personally have no evidence and I'm not going to recommend something I don't know much about. Okay. But peroxide is an interesting one to be gargling with. Um, it's not something one usually uses for gargling. Okay, and then there was one I want to ask in the event of drinking alcohol, because in most of the areas where people sit outside and share bottles, does COVID-19 transmit in that way because of the air flowing outside? They would transmit because of the saliva rather than because of the alcohol. And so what you're suggesting quite rightly and very cleverly is that if I'm drinking booze and it's got alcohol in it, um, why doesn't it kill the virus? And the answer is probably does. But that's not where the virus is. It's the, the virus is probably in the saliva and it's around the bottle. So unless you, you, you tip the bottle up Black that a couple of times and wipe it over. Um, I think that is probably where the, the, the transmission could take place from. I don't think anybody's done any studies to see how efficient alcohol sharing bottles are for transmitting of, 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 of COVID. But I would imagine, you know, if you've actually taken a swig and then you're trying to recover from it, you might gasp or blow out or something. And that in itself causes an aerosol. So, yeah. Okay, so there are two questions here with regards to sports and informal games. The first one is, would it be okay for children to play informal games like soccer during break without wearing masks or rather with masks on, so they're outdoors? And then the second one is a bit more blunt. Why is kicking a ball prohibited? Uh, okay, I'll, I'll come back to the second one, but, but let me do the first one first. I think it's a very good idea for children to get out and do whatever they need to do as much activity outside as possible. The question is, will you get transmission if you're jumping on top of each other like they do in soccer and rugby and football and all the other games they play? And the answer is possibly that it might be transmission because the people are breathing heavily and so on and so forth. Um, I, and, and you do remember if you, if you watch sport, because my husband is an ardent football supporter, um, that they, people do get sick in, in, in uh, the test positive in these situations. So it, to my mind, it's very difficult to play sports with the mask on, um, for children particularly. I, I would hazard a guess and say that if they are playing sports and contact sports, that they do increase their risk of transmission. However, having said that, um, I think if they can be careful about it, they would probably be all right. And that, that, that sounds like a very roundabout way of saying that I think it's okay. Um, the use of a mask when you're playing rugby or soccer or, or football is going to be very difficult to my mind, especially when going to those comms and things 
you know, whatever they do. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, exchange of, of, of brave breathing down there. So I think that might not be the best, but yeah, wear a mask if they need to. I, I personally don't think they need to. I don't know if there's any evidence for that, but I could always look it up. I, I haven't looked, I haven't looked into that. And, and, the, and the, 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 so if I could look up that and I'll get back to you to see if anybody has any evidence on it, okay? That'll be fairer. And the second one was? And the second one is why is football prohibited? Why is cooking a ball prohibited? I suppose it's maybe because of the, the, the heavy breathing. I don't think so. I think, mm, yeah, I think it's because it's a group activity more than anything else really. Um, there's a question on when social distancing and opening classroom windows, is it okay for the learners to remove their masks, but the teacher keeps theirs on? No, I don't think so. I think there is transmission peer to peer, as I mentioned. Mm -hmm. So um, it's more protective if we keep allow the children to keep their mask on. Because if the teacher wants to keep a mask on, the kids are not keeping their mask on. What's the point? Yeah. You know? I think it should be one rule for everybody. Okay, everybody, windows open, sit far apart, keep your mask on, but go out for your break, for your mask free break, go outside, take your mask off, jump up and down, breathe some more, and then come back and, and get rejuvenated in that way. Okay, no, that's super. I'm just going through some of them to try and pull out some. We've spoken about ventilation. There's a question on what is qualified as ventilation, two windows per 15 people. I suppose it depends on the space of the room. It does indeed. Uh, ventilation just means the introduction of fresh air into a space. Mm. So it doesn't mean that you have gale force winds blowing through the place. It just means that you feel comfortable, that you can't smell anything that's stale around you, um, and that it's fresh. Mm. And that usually is about in the old day, what was known as six air changes an hour or so. And in the new days, it, uh, I mean, these days it'll probably be considered 10. 10, 10 liters per second per person and so on. It's a strange way of calculating it. But honestly, if you walk into a room, any one of us, you, your skin will tell you if there's good ventilation or not. If you either feel stuffy or you feel a bit fresh, just a bit of a breeze. And I think that should be sufficient. Yeah. It's very, unless you get somebody to come and test the ventilation, mm. you know. Um, but if you've got a window open there and a door sort of semi-open on that side, that, that's adequate ventilation to be going through. Um, Prof, there are a number of questions that are asking um, whether people can and can't do certain things and should and shouldn't do things. Um, and I think uh, the, the basis of your discussion is let's be a bit more sensible. Let's hear the information and let's hear the science before we start having to do all these things. Um, there was one saying during skills training, woodwork or arts or crafts or food production, if learners work at their own desks, can they continue? Um, and special schools that have been directed not to do the skill subject. I don't see the logic of that. So if they're working in their own space, in their own socially distant spaces, uh, are they, and they are obviously have been instructed properly to clean their hands and the surfaces are clean and they're wearing a face cover, it's perfectly fine. It's like me, we're working in my office. No. You know? I, I mean, I think, especially for children with disabilities, they really need to be occupied. They need to get occupational therapy a lot more than most others do. And I think for them, it's very important that they feel engaged in whatever they're doing. Mm. Um, and many of them have taken very well to wearing face covers. Mm. Um, so I think it's, it, it, it's important that we, because it's going to be the new norm uh, until we don't get the vaccine. So we might as well allow these activities that, that, um, that, that allows them to feel better about themselves because they've been cooped up now for almost six months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think it's a good idea to let them do that, yeah. Well, I think I'm just going to take the last question, which has got to do with social distancing and 1.5 meters apart in schools. Um, um, there's an arrangement of desks, whether they're facing each other or not facing each other. Maybe your comments on, on the social or the spatial distancing rather of desks and learners on those desks? Right, so what, what we, when we went to talk about this in various different community setups, it became evident that nobody had a cooking clue what one meter was, including me, by the way, but anyway. Um, so we decided that we will say, if you stretch your arm out and the other person stretches their arm out, that is between 1.5 to two meters. 
So when you're sitting down at your desk and you stick your arm out and your, your colleague or your, your, your friend next to you sticks their arm out and they don't touch you, then that is 1.5 meters or two, two meters. Um, if you do it to the front, it's the same. And if you do it to the back, it's the same. So that is the space that we think is good. I don't know whether you think that's a good way of doing it or not, but it's the easiest way of doing it. Um, because measuring space is not going to help really. Yeah. No, that's super. Some of the other questions that have come through, I do apologize to the attendees. We're not going to answer them all. Um, we do know that it is Friday afternoon and it is four o'clock and Prof has got load shedding heading her way as well, I believe. So we've got to make sure she's got a bit of time to do some work. I'll just hand over to Mr. Calder to say final words. And thank you very much, Prof, from, our, from my side. Really very informative. Lots and lots of information. People are already asking for the recording. They're asking for the presentation. But if you would like to share that, just email it to me. If not, I'll understand why. But we will be sharing the recording with all the attendees as well. And um, we will be placing it out on our Facebook page and on our YouTube um, sites as well. So thanks very much, Prof. Over to you, Paul. Thank you very much, Paul. Great pleasure. Great pleasure indeed. Prof, can I just read to you what some of the attendees have said? One principal said, I'm listening to Prof. Shain Meta. Wow. This is the best I've heard throughout the pandemic. My parents and staff need to see this presentation. That's just one of the comments that have been pouring in. Well, that is that is definitely a very huge compliment from a headmaster. People that you scared of all your life. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was brilliant, Prof. Thank you very much. And uh, let me give uh, our attendees the assurance that this presentation will be available. It will be sent to you. And please share it with as many people as uh, you can share it with, if you don't mind, Prof. Because this is the type of information that needs to get to schools, to teachers, to parents, to learners, to everybody. Thank you very, very much. Evidence might change. I just want, there's a note of caution there. If the evidence changes, okay, but yes, I'd be happy for you to, to, to share. Thank you so much, everybody. At least we have some scientific evidence now. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Prof. Thank you to Paul Rankin for hosting, and thank you to all our attendees. Kanitila uh, Navik, may you have a very good weekend. Thank you to all of you. And Goodbye. To you. All of you. Goodbye.